Welcome to Liberty in Law, the inaugural podcast here on the Launchpad Media Network. Very glad to be here. I am DK Williams. I am a lawyer. I'm a libertarian. Give you a little background about me uh, before we get underway. The idea behind Liberty in Law uh, podcast here is that uh, obviously as a libertarian, as we all are on this site, to discuss current issues about how Supreme Court decisions about how uh, even whatever may happen to be in the news at the time, things that are going on, and how the law affects our ability to be free. Most of the time, it hurts it, right? Almost every time it hurts it, unless, of course, one of those laws is repealed or curtailed or cut back in some other way. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some history of some of those cases, about how uh, Supreme Court decisions have gotten us to where we are right now, where the Constitution is um, barely recognizable from when it was first passed. And I'm not talking about the amendments. I'm talking about the court decisions interpreting it. And basically, you know, that obviously ties into Lysander Spooner, right, about how it, it either has allowed our current government to exist or it's been unable to prevent it. And either way, what what good is it, right? So I'm going to talk about how we've gotten here. What has happened along the way, Um, how the Supreme Court and other courts as well, but primarily the Supreme Court, have simply ignored, for example, Article 1, Section 8 and the enumerated powers, how they've just blatantly ignored them. And we're going to talk about a case today where they do something just as bad um, to uh, make sure that government is beyond the same power Uh, are the same limitations that we have as mere individuals, right? As mere serfs, the sovereign gets special consideration. Even when Congress has passed a statute, that doesn't exempt Congress or doesn't exempt the federal government. The courts find a way to ignore that and do whatever they want. And since this is the inaugural podcast, a little bit about me so you know where I'm coming from. I am a 1989 graduate, University of North Carolina. It's undergrad, got a BA in economics. Stayed there, did not move. Went to law school, graduated there in 1992. Clerked for a federal judge and then um, got into the law. And some of the stuff that's most relevant to this type of um, the discussion is uh, some of the death penalty work I've done. Um, among the, um, the highlight of that was when I represented a guy on death row back in North Carolina and we went to the state Supreme Court in North Carolina uh, arguing about uh, a, a new statute uh, that the General Assembly in North Carolina had passed that required the state to turn over evidence. They didn't want to turn it over. They said it didn't apply to them. All right. Imagine that. Or they were reading it in a way that made it not apply to them. So I got to argue that and uh, we won. So that was pretty cool. Uh, I was also on what they call the CJA panels for the Middle District of North Carolina and the Eastern District of North Carolina. That's the appointed attorneys uh, that represent criminal defendants uh, in federal criminal cases. So I did uh, a lot of drug cases, a couple of bank robbery cases, uh, one ATF case about possession of a, of a illegal gun pursuant to the federal code. Uh, one one that I remember that particularly stood out. So I've walked the halls. I've been among the, the U.S. attorneys and the, the, the defense counsel and the judges and the magistrates and the staff and the U.S. marshals and all of that. And it was a great thing to do. Um, I definitely learned a lot. And I'm just, uh, I've chosen not to do any of that anymore and move on to some more sedentary type things like representing small businesses and talking about the uh, Congress and the court system and how horrible it is for most people that get involved with it. Since I've been in Colorado since uh, 2002, been involved with the Libertarian Party of Colorado. I was the state chair. Before that, I was the legislative director, run for office three different times, um, including when I ran for a a non-affiliated position in the local, um, the RTD, the the light rail and bus service regional transit district, Um, came in second out of four people. And I beat the two Republicans, even though it's a nonpartisan race. Everybody knows who's who, right? Uh, Democrat won the election. But if those two Republicans had not stolen my votes, I would have won. 
I say that tongue in cheek because that's what they always say about us, right? So last week, Donald Trump basically inflamed all of the popular media when he was uh, being interviewed on Fox News. And he was discussing how Michael Cohen was facing some charges and he had pled guilty to them and that he uh, that Cohen had apparently implicated Donald Trump in some campaign finance violations. And one of the things that Trump said was that uh, flipping ought to be outlawed. And he's right. He's absolutely right. And for a short, brief period of time, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, which includes Colorado, where I'm sitting, had that rule in place. They said it was illegal to flip in exchange for lesser sentence. And think about this. That, I mean, it makes sense just in a justice context. Because if, for example, I walk up to somebody and go, hey, I know you're testifying in this trial and here's 50 bucks and I just want you to make sure you testify honestly. Okay, that is a clear violation of a statute that would result in a felony conviction for me. I didn't say to lie. I didn't say anything other than to testify truthfully in exchange for $50. So that's illegal. But what do the federal prosecutors do? Every single day in every single drug case, for example, in this country, they will have someone testify against a defendant who is getting freedom in exchange for testimony. They are, for example, getting three years back off of a sentence they've already been, uh, they're already serving time for in jail. So they've got a 10 year sentence. They have some information, allegedly, about a person that is currently being prosecuted. And the U.S. attorney says, hey, if you testify about what you know about the guy we're prosecuting right now, or a woman, we will cut three years off your sentence. And we'll recommend it to the judge. It's up to the judge, ultimately. But you know, that, that's the way the system works. You testify against somebody, we'll give you freedom. And that's perfectly legit under the law as it stands. So you can't give somebody 50 bucks to tell them the truth. That's a felony. But if you give somebody three years of their life back or more, that's perfectly okay in the United States right now. That's just ridiculous. I mean, that's a travesty. And for a short period of time, the Tenth Circuit upheld a defendant's claim that the person who had testified against them and gotten consideration for less time in jail, that that should be excluded under the statute, which we'll talk about the federal statute that applies to bribery, and that that testimony should not be allowed in her case. Of course, the trial judge threw that out, right, because they do it all the time. And so trial judges are very unlikely to make a ruling that would change uh, the way things have been done for, for decades and decades. She was convicted and she appealed to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals. Now, the way these Court of Appeals work is that first you have a three-person panel, a three-judge panel that hears the arguments. And this three-judge panel agreed with her and said, yeah, the statute is clear. And we'll look at the language of it. But the statute is clear. You can't offer anything of value. Statute doesn't say of money. It says you cannot offer anything of value in exchange for testimony. And clearly, that's what the U.S. attorney was doing, right? Giving time out of jail to someone in exchange for testimony. That is certainly a value. Well, when this three-judge panel made this ruling in her favor and ordered a new trial, they said, all right, you guys, you guys have to retry her if you want to, but you can't use this guy's testimony. And so that was one major piece of evidence. Um, and the U.S. attorneys across the United States and you know, local DAs, for that matter, if it was going to apply to them via their state laws, or if the rationale would apply to them, they freaked out. And this was in the late 90s. It was in 98 when the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals um, ruled in Sonia Singleton's favor. And to give you an idea of how pr uh, prevalent this practice is, it still is today, because ultimately that, that, that Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals decision did not stand, it's not just me, not just some libertarian saying this is what the, the U.S. attorneys do all the time. Jeffrey Tubin, who was discussing Trump's statement about flipping ought to be illegal because they were just making stuff up about him, making stuff up about Trump to get a better deal. Tubin said the following, and I quote him, the business of flipping, 
The business of getting defendants to cooperate on one another is the entire basis, just about, of how U.S. attorneys' offices work, how federal prosecutions work in this country. As a former federal prosecutor myself, I think it works pretty well. The idea that it is somehow improper or should be unlawful is astonishing, especially if you think criminals ought to be prosecuted. That's the best way we know how to do it. End quote. So you can see how this liberal legal analyst for CNN is just appalled that anybody would suggest you shouldn't be able to give time off of a sentence in exchange for testimony, even though they would readily admit, well, you can't give anybody 50 bucks for it. It reminds me of uh, Al Chervik, played by Rodney Dangerfield in Caddyshack. When they're about to start the big golf game, a lot of money on the line, Al Chervik goes up to Brian Doyle Murray's character, who's like the efficient officiating the, the, the match. Hands, he's got a, like a couple hundred dollar bills in his, in his hand. He walks up to Brian Doyle Murray, slips it to him and goes, keep it fair, keep it fair, will you? He didn't say cheat. He didn't say make sure we win. He said keep it fair. And what's funny about that scene, of course, is Brian Doyle Murray, as he pockets the money, says, oh, no, I can't. So in essence, that's what we have in the Department of Justice every single day in this country where one person flips on another one. And I did a three-week jury trial in Wilmington, North Carolina. We had 13 defendants, all um, a part of an alleged drug conspiracy. And here's a little trivia question for you. How many grams of crack cocaine, because this case I'm talking about dealt with crack cocaine, how many grams of crack cocaine does the U.S. attorney have to show to the federal jury in order for a defendant to get life in prison for that. I mean, they have to bring in, bring in the crack cocaine and, and have evidence that the defendant bought it or sold it or somehow involved with uh, the illegal transfer uh, sale of that amount of drugs. How much do you think? Because three of the defendants in this case, the three main guys, according to the government, all got life imprisonment. So what is the least amount of cocaine, crack cocaine in this case, that the government has to show to a jury to get life in prison? The answer is zero grams. They don't have to have a dust, a, a particle of dust of drugs to come into the courtroom. All they need is to bring in another criminal defendant from another case who's in, in this particular case I was involved with had it already been convicted in other matters. And they would come into the in front of the court, in front of the jury, and say, yeah, I transferred or was involved in a drug deal with the defendant sitting right there and that defendant sitting right there and that defendant right there. And we exchanged, um, I would buy uh, one kilo from them like four different times. All right, so that's four kilos right there that is now pegged to these defendants by testimonial evidence, testimonial evidence that is based upon getting time off of that guy's sentence, right? In the notion that somebody like Tubin and, and most regular legal analysts would say that that the notion that we shouldn't do that, the notion that we shouldn't let people be bribed for testimony, the notion that that somehow is that idea that we shouldn't do that is somehow outrageous. That's outrageous. So back to Yvette Singleton, who was the defendant in this particular case where the Tenth Circuit said that uh, she would get a new trial because the government had violated the statute. She was a mule. She had uh, transported drugs from California to Kansas, and she had taken place uh, or helped uh, facilitate some Western Union transfers of money. So she was convicted on one count of conspiracy to distribute illegal drugs and eight counts of money laundering because she had done or been involved in eight uh, Western Union transfers. She was sentenced to 48 months for those. And just so you know, in federal court, you have to do 85% of your sentence. So you can get good time for not getting in trouble for behaving yourself, and but the most you can get is 15% off of your sentence. So that leaves you with 85%. So if you get a 10-year federal sentence, you could conceivably uh, do eight and a half years if you got all your good time. This lady is obviously relatively small, uh, small potatoes because she only got 48 months. And, and I mean, that's a long time, obviously, right, in real, real life. But in federal drug cases, that's not a whole lot. Like I said, those cases, guys I was involved with got life in, life sentences, and they were never getting out, not unless their cases were overturned on appeal, which uh, I do not believe they ever were. I represented a smaller person, more like this lady, more like this Yvette Singleton, uh, a much smaller role, uh, and I think my lady got about the same amount of time. So here's the statute that is in question. It's 18 U.S. Code Section 201, 
C2, and it says, whoever, directly or indirectly, gives, offers, or promises anything of value to any person for or because of the testimony under oath or affirmation given or to be given by such person as a witness upon a trial before any court shall be fined under this title or imprisoned for not more than two years or both. So it's a maximum of two years for bribing somebody, right? And it doesn't have to be money. It's anything of value. And it says whoever, it doesn't say whoever except the United States attorney or whoever except a government official. It says whoever. And the Judge Kelly, who's like one of my new heroes who I didn't even realize, I didn't know a thing about him until I went back and looked at this case after Trump's comments. He read that and applied it as it's actually written. Imagine that, right? And so did the other two judges on his panel. It was a unanimous 3 nothing uh, decision originally. Now, this so freaked out the U.S. attorneys that they immediately asked for a, a rehearing with all 10 judges of the 10th Circuit. It's called en banc, like all of them. Will he rehear it? So, you know, you've got a 3-0, right? Or going into it, you've got three in your favor. Uh, I mean, they, they can change their mind upon re-argument, but, you know, in this case, they did not. And the entire Tenth Circuit said that, all right, this is not in place. We're going to hold off on enforcing the, uh, th- this panel's decision. And uh, it's not enforced until we rehear it on bonk, we, until we all rehear it. And they did. They reheard it. And, of course, the, the Tenth Circuit on bonk said that whoever, as it is in the statute, whoever did not mean the U.S. attorney. And this is one of those things where you'll see this frequently, especially as somebody like you who cares about liberty. And, uh, you know, that's, those few times when the government gives us a break from the power of the government for the courts then to ignore that and say, no, the Congress didn't mean the, the plain words that they used is really something is really stark. It stands out. And this is one of those times, especially because the 10th Circuit on bonk decision that said the statute doesn't apply to the federal government first says we have to give words their regular meaning. And then they spend four and a half pages telling us why they're not going to give that word is regular meaning. It's really a joke. It's, it's, it's quite absurd. One of the reasons that the uh, on bonk 10th Circuit overturned the original panel's decision deals with the concept of sovereign immunity and the government, the sovereign does not give up any power or authority unless it specifically says so. That's the, that's the legal theory behind it. And of course, in this particular statute, it says whoever, right? Um, It didn't have any exceptions for, for the government, but the on banc panel said that, well, they, what they needed to say is, whoever, including the U.S. attorney, which goes against many other interpretations of parallel provisions in this particular uh, statute. But they threw that in there because they just could not have the outcome that the government wouldn't be able to offer freedom to people in order to testify against uh, people they wanted to put in jail for, for drugs, you know, for the drug war. Got to keep that going. And so one of the things the en banc court talked about was this concept of sovereign immunity. And that goes back to the divine right of kings, right? I mean, we obviously, uh, this country came from uh, uh, the legal heritage of the English common law, and that evolved from the divine right of kings, which said that kings are, or monarchs, could, could be a queen, serve because God has selected them, right? And if God has selected them, the king can do no wrong. Therefore, there's sovereign immunity. You can't sue the king. All right. That's where that comes from. Now, that has been eroded, but it's still that idea still exists in this country. For example, here in Denver, talked about RTD a bit ago. If an RTD bus driver causes an accident, is negligent in some way, just a regular traffic accident. Right. If there was not a statute that said someone can sue RTD or the bus driver working for the government agency running the transportation, then you couldn't because the divine right of kings, the king was selected by God. The king picked the bus drivers, right? And therefore they can't make a mistake. So you can't sue them. Well, most places have, have changed that by statute, but that's what it required. They said, yes, you can sue uh, a bus driver and his employer, which is this government entity, but only because of the grace of the sovereign, they decided to let you do that. So that's kind of a amazingly archaic remnant 
of the common law to which we are still subjected as mere serfs in the United States of America. And even then, in the case of the, the bus drivers, they have a different statute of limitations because the statute says you've got to put the government entity on notice and you've got six months to do that. You don't have to file a claim. You don't have to like sue them yet, but you've got to fill out the statutory form or follow the statutory form. Let the RTD, the government entity know that you have a claim so they can prepare to defend against it or investigate it. Right? Well, if you or I get into a car wreck, there's no such requirement, right? You've got three years to sue them and that's it. The government still gives itself special treatment in a case like that by saying, okay, we'll let you sue us, but you're going to have to give us a lot more of a courtesy than you do your regular fellow commoner who might cause an accident. And so that idea comes back into the Tenth Circuit's decision here that said it's okay for the government, despite the language passed by Congress, it's okay for it not to apply to the federal government because they didn't specifically say it applied to the federal government. It's really, it's really convoluted. It's really twisted because, like I mentioned, they say we're going to give these words their plain meaning, whoever means whoever, but we're not really going to say it's whoever. And that's the kind of thing that we have to deal with in this country. And the more I think we're aware of it, and so I, I give props to Trump for making this an issue, for saying something about it. Now, of course, he only said something because it was involving him personally, right? He, I have zero doubt that um, he was thinking about anybody other than himself. But nevertheless, what he's talking about does apply. Um, and he talked about clearly about how um, people have an incentive to make something up to get freedom to get some time off of their sentence. And that's what Judge Kelly, who did the right thing in the original Court of Appeals, 10th Circuit Court of Appeals, mentions. And there's all kinds of case law on this. That, oh yeah, sure, sure. Um, This does provide an incentive to manufacture testimony to make stuff up, but we ultimately don't care because it's up to the jury to decide if they're going to believe it or not. Now, of course, you can make that same argument for regular people, but they don't make the argument for regular people. They just make that argument for the government. So glad that Trump brought this to some people's attention. I have no uh, pretense or, or, or fantasy that this is going to be changed anytime soon. But at least we can let people know that it exists, that it is a travesty, that it is a ridiculous uh, way to prosecute people. We basically have an entire criminal justice system, primarily in federal court, almost exclusively in drug cases anyway, based on snitches, based on people's testimony who've already been convicted against somebody else that the government wants to convict. And if you want to read more about this particular case with uh, Yvette Singleton, the history of it, the two cases uh, that are are published um, in the U.S. report or the the Tenth Circuit reports, uh, you can go to my blog. Well, I've got a link to the actual cases themselves, the actual language of the cases, the actual written opinions, and that's dkwilliams.net, dkwilliams.net. So check there for uh, uh, more information on this. I'll have some other case law or other articles on different cases up there as well. Also check out my blog, uh, bluecarp.net blog, like popular culture issues and how popular culture reflects, the government reflects, uh, sometimes libertarianism, right? I mean, one article I wrote dealt with The Walking Dead and Negan. I mean, it's it's an obvious comparison for for libertarians to notice, but that Negan, who ran this community, would go find other communities, tell them that if they didn't give them a whole bunch of stuff, that Negan's crew would then kill some people, right? That's clearly a parallel to the U.S. government. You give us tribute or we will hurt you, right? And so that's the type of popular culture thing that I think most people wouldn't relate that to the government. They wouldn't compare Negan and his crew, the saviors, to the government. But that's where on the uh, bluecarp.net blog, that's where I point out things like that. And they are everywhere. So check that out as well. Follow me on Twitter, at bluecarp. Again, this is DK Williams. This has been the inaugural Liberty and Law podcast. And remember, my friends, freedom is dangerous. Live dangerously. And before we go, I'd like to thank my friends at speakeasyideas.com for helping me produce this podcast. 